Hi, everyone. My name is John Miller, President of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series, Grace and Speed, Muskoka Wooden Boat Stories. First, we'd like to acknowledge the First Peoples, who, for thousands of years before us, were and are still the keepers and caretakers of this land where we now live and work. We're dedicated to honoring the Indigenous history and culture and committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. In particular, for Muskoka, all four cultures, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, and Métis that inhabited these lands, either currently or historically. We recognize all the generations of Indigenous people and their historic connection to this place, and we're grateful for the opportunity to gather here at this time. This series is a digital component of our $8.5 million revitalization project at the Muskoka Discovery Center. The physical transformation of our building is almost complete, with three dynamic exhibits being created, growing and evolving with inspired content. Those exhibits are the Muskoka story, an exhibit about how through a process of conflict and resolution, this storied area of Ontario was evolved after first contact to become one of the most important tourist destinations in the world. Miskuaki, Confluence of Cultures, a presentation about four indigenous cultures with a presence in Muskoka for over 13,000 years, all of which have teachings to share about sustainability and care for our environment. And Wanda Three, our 108 year old steam yacht. Uh, she's presently in the middle of an electrification repowerment and she'll be a working artifact and an important symbol of sustainability when complete. The Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center in partnership with Antique and Classic Boat Society is excited to present this series of eight webinars showcasing wooden works of art that have made Muskoka home to arguably the best concentration of quality wooden boats in the world. Our volunteer team of Chris Bullen, uh, who's responsible for all the video and still images, Ian Turnbull, Mary Story, Murray Walker, Ed Skinner, and Rick Terry, along with many boat owners, have put in countless hours to produce this series, and we're extremely grateful for their contributions. I'd also like to thank Jordan Waynes and Ann Curley, who are working behind the scenes to make this webinar happen. This entire series, when complete, will be available in our archives, on our website, and as a permanent display within the Muskoka Discovery Center. Following this presentation, which is approximately 40 minutes long, we'll have a Q&A with our panelists. Uh, it's an entertaining part of the webinar, so please post questions in our Q&A button on your screen, and we'll read them once this presentation uh, concludes. So enjoy the video, and we'll see you for the Q&A afterwards. On behalf of Muskoka Steamships and Discovery Center and the Antique and Classic Boat Society Toronto, welcome to today's episode four of eight, exploring facets of Muskoka's wooden boat legacy. I'm Ian Turnbull on behalf of our production team, including Chris Bullen, Murray Walker, Mary Story, Ed Skinner, and Rick Terry. Once again, I must stress that the wooden boat era in Muskoka is a story with many facets, and we only have time in this webinar series to skim the surface, hopefully leaving you thirsty for more to come in future episodes. Tom Gravett was born in 1881 in England. We learned last week that he started working in Ditchburn's livery business in Port Carling in the 1890s and then with Ditchburn in Gravenhurst until he started Gravett Boats in 1930 at the beginning of the Great Depression. To keep the Muskoka wooden boat story in context, remember from last week's episode that by 1930, disappearing propeller boat production had moved from Port Carling to Lindsay. Duke Boats had started in 1924. Billy Johnson had started Port Carling Boat Works in 1925, but then gone back to building boats on his own in 1929. By 1930, Ditchburn was facing financial difficulties. Nonetheless, Tom Gravett launched his business, which became renowned for streamliner launches and Miss Canada racers. Tom Gravett died in Gravenhurst in 1958. Sometimes events combine leading to unexpected outcomes. Such was the case in the mid-30s when a beautiful brand new Manette Shields launch built for Lake Joseph cottager Fred Burgess, burned at the end of her first season in 1934. The following year, Mr. Burgess ordered a new boat from Tom Gravett, who commissioned John Hacker to design it. Curlew, the biggest and best streamliner ever built, was the result, leading 
to production of about 60 streamliners over the next three decades. A very good outcome for Gravette boats. This is the 1934 Manette Shields Beauty built for Fred Burgess, demonstrating the mid-30s trend to forward drive launches with raked windshields and the engine behind the driver. Unlike the center drive vertical windshield long deck launches of the 20s, which had the engine in front of the driver. With views here that demonstrate the mastery of Bert Manette's craftsmanship, the boat was lost to fire at the end of her first season. These next few images of Curlew demonstrate the beauty of John Hacker's design and Gravette's boat building expertise. This is her torpedo stern. To quote Maria Walker, an excellent example of form or design and function, performance, which you will see shortly in the film. Along with fit in the curvature of the mahogany planks of the hull. And finish, notice the reflection of the dock planks in Curlew's mirror finish. And here is form. Fit and finish and function. This ad for the 1954 National Motorboat Show in New York City says, The Gravette Streamliner is designed and built expressly for people who demand the finest. Its unexcelled beauty and quality construction make it the smartest thing on the water. Built in sizes from 18 to 28 feet, the Streamliner is capable of speeds up to 50 miles per hour. Or to be correct, in 2022, that's 80 kilometers an hour. The more recent images of streamliners in this slide underway on the lake make the point about their beauty. This picture says it all. If you're cruising in a streamliner, life is good. Gravette, like Ditchburn a decade earlier, built a famous series of race boats. It all started in 1932 when Ernie Wilson of Ingersoll, Ontario invested in and became president of Gravette Boats. He was also president of the Ingersoll Machine and Tool Company in Ingersoll, Ontario. Gravettes commissioned John Hacker to build a series of Little Miss Canada race boats for Ernie's son, Harold. In 1937, Douglas Van Patten became Gravettes' naval architect, designing the bigger Miss Canada series. In 1939, Miss Canada 3 is heralded in the New York Times as an invading craft because she won the President's Cup. President Roosevelt, though, seems quite impressed. That's Harold Wilson on the left and his wife, mechanic Lorna, standing behind the President. On the image in the left, you can see the Capitol building in the background. Here is Murray Walker in the late 80s driving a faithful replica of Miss Canada 3, commissioned by him and built in 1987 by Duke Marine Services in Port Carling, with Ed Skinner managing the project. Douglas Van Patten, the original designer of the boat, provided advice at the time. Notice the tiny figure sitting in the boat to Murray's right. That's his daughter Megan. You'll see her driving boats in this webinar series and we'll hear her thoughts on wooden boats in episode 8. Stay tuned, it's worth the wait. Miss Canada 3 and 4 on Boat Show Day at the Muskoka Discovery Center in July 2013. Here is 22-foot streamliner Little Miss Canada 5, the last of the Miss Canada series built in 1954 for Ernie Wilson, president of Gravette Boats. She is now owned by Jeff Mitchell, grandson of Ernie Wilson. And now we have Chris Boland's film on Curlew, the streamliner that started it all. Listen carefully to Murray Walker's comments. He highlights the Gravette story and Curlew's features. The first 
what we're looking at this morning is a Curlew, a 35-foot uh, Gravette Streamliner. On a quick note, its uh, significance is that it's the very first Streamliner that was ever built. It's also the longest Streamliner, the only known one that's pointed at both ends. But the history goes a little deeper than that. I've learned that in the early days, one of the Muskoka cottagers on Lake Joe wanted to have a new boat built to add to his fleet of wooden boats. He commissioned the famous architect John Hacker to design a boat for him, which in this case was Curlew. But he hesitated dealing with uh, Ditchburn in 1936 uh, due to their sort of precarious financial position at that time. He'd also had a little bit of a problem with Minette over a boat that Minette had built and had burned at one time. So he then turned to Gravett, who really wasn't in a whole lot better shape, but nevertheless he commissioned Gravett to build Curlew. And it spawned several interesting things. First of all, the success of Curlew with the, the elliptical shape uh, it was such a success that uh, Gravettes went on to build many more streamliners, uh, primarily the 22-foot uh, and some 24s and a few larger ones. But the 22-footer really put Gravette on the map. The interesting part about the relationship that developed between John Hacker and Gravette was that they went on to design a little 225 class hydro, which became known as Little Miss Canada 2. Little Miss Canada 2 was really the first purpose-built race boat for the Wilson family and they went on to build, a year later, an even greater boat called Little Miss Canada 3, which won the world championship for the 225 class boat. Little Miss Canada 2 still exists and is the only original Little Miss Canada boat left. But that kind of relationship with Hacker went on to really spawn the development of the larger unlimited boats and that really put Gravette on the map. So it has a tremendous history, not only dealing with Curlew, but dealing with the relationship with John Hacker and the ultimate development of the Miss Canada series. Welcome to our next film featuring Dix, a 21-foot ditch burn racer built in 1927 for the Clemson family of Philadelphia. They were cottagers on Lake Muskoka. 
She subsequently went to Lake Abays, then back to Lake Muskoka in the 50s, Lake Joseph, and now she's with Murray Walker on Lake Muskoka. She's one of a series of ditch burn racers pointed at each end, both bow and stern. Here she is docked during her time on Lake Abays with Cameron Peck. And here at speed. We'll see her on Lake Muskoka in our film shortly. This is 28-foot B4, designed by Bert Hawker and built by Ditchburn in 1921, six years before Dix. The boat was originally built for Carl Borntrigger of Cinderwood Island on Lake Muskoka. We met him in Episode 1 as the owner of the Manette yacht Rita. In 1935, Cameron Peck of Lake Abays bought B4. She's running at speed on Lake Abays in the top image, but she's lived on Lake Rosso in recent decades. In our introduction to Curlew in this episode, we've looked at the race boat connection between the Wilson family and Gravette boats, resulting in the Miss Canada series of race boats. There was a similar connection a decade earlier between Harry Greening and Herb Ditchburn, and it resulted in the Rainbow series of racers. Harry Greening was a successful businessman in Hamilton, Ontario with Greening Wire Company Limited. He constantly experimented with design improvement, regularly winning international speedboat races. The original Rainbow 3 resides in Muskoka today. Replicas of Rainbow 1 and Rainbow 4 have been built locally in recent years for a cottager on Lake Muskoka. His innovations, speed and endurance records brought international recognition to Canada. In 2003, he was inducted to the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame as a significant contributor to powerboat racing. This is Rainbow 3 in 1923, and Rainbow 3 at a Muskoka Lakes Association boat show in Port Carling. Rainbow 1 at the New York Boat Show in 1920. And now we have Chris Boland's film on Dix. Listen carefully to Murray Walker's comments. He highlights the features that make her unique. Uh, Dix is a very interesting little 21-foot ditch burn that was built in 1927. It has a lot of design features that were incorporated into the rainbow boats, but on a much smaller scale. And it was a custom-built boat for the Clemson family of Beaumaris, and I understand that it was a gift to their son for his birthday. It's a very interesting boat uh, because of its originality. It still has the Scripps Junior Gold Cup engine that was very rare in its time, but it must have made a young Mr. Clemson one of the fastest people to, to race around the lake as a teenager. Fortunately, we've been able to keep the original kind of power in it and able to restore most, in fact, all of the boat. It didn't need a great deal of restoration. It, uh, it was very significant in terms of there was only one boat built like that. The, uh, the decorative tow rails that go around the edge of the deck, I think, add some design features beautifully uh, sculptured dash panel, and uh, an all-around fun boat, uh, one that I really enjoy taking out for quiet evening runs. In fact, you can move along at a fairly good speed at only 500 RPM. The kind of boat that turns over at 200 RPM, and once it's warmed up, is a great little boat to, uh, to purr around the shore in.
Now we will visit with Eaglet 2, a truly unique 1927 Manette Shield, 36 feet long. The Foreman family of Buffalo, New York, ordered Eaglet 2 in 1926 to replace the first Eaglet bought when they purchased Eagle Island on Lake Joseph in 1921. Her purpose was to transport the family on all three lakes in solid comfort, and she excelled at her duties. In episode 2, we met Leglon, which means Eaglet in French. Leglon and Eaglet lived together on Eagle Island for decades. Here's Eaglet leaving the Port Carling boat show about a decade ago. I took the video and it's not great, but if I can work it right, you'll notice the boat's beautiful lines. I'll stop and start it and try to describe what I think makes Eaglet so very beautiful. So here she is turning before she heads downstream. And let's just look at her again and try and do it slowly. So she's starting to turn. Notice the flare in her bow that's below the deck down to the water line as she turns slowly 180 degrees. And then notice the tumble home at the uh, stern. That's the narrow deck where it narrows in from the breadth of the bottom of the boat. And then as she continues to turn, to turn, notice the shear line, which is where the deck meets the sides of the boat as we move forward. Beautiful design. One more time. And here's the view over her long deck from the driver's seat. And now we have Chris Bullen's Eaglet 2 film. Again, listen carefully to Marie Walker's commentary. first boat that I had was actually a small shepherd boat that I saw as a teenager. That boat I did part with uh, when I had the opportunity to buy Clary, a 1920 Hutchison boat. But while it wasn't made in Muskoka, it was made for a, a Toronto businessman and was used in a racing circuit called the Great Lakes Gold Cup Series, which uh, took place in Toronto, Detroit and Buffalo. It was a circuit where each week they would go to a different destination. That kind of kindled more of my interest in race boats. And then when I got to Muskoka, I realized the immense history of Muskoka racing, which involved the Miss Canada boats, prior to that the rainbow boats, and then ultimately led to even more boats that to many people are lesser known, but are certainly important boats that uh, achieved success, and hopefully they won't be forgotten. At an early age, I was fortunate that uh, while living in the Lake Simcoe area, my dad took me to an estate that had a very old boat that he remembered as a teenager, actually. And I was so caught with that boat that the length, the history, the provenance, and so on. I was fortunate to, uh, when I was about 30 to acquire the boat. That sort of got me started in terms of my interest in wooden boats. And because this was a race boat, uh, I became even more interested in uh, the fact that race boats were sort of the forefront of technology. And that led me to Muskoka because after joining the Antique and Classic Boat Society, I made, made some new friends and they invited me to Muskoka. I think I became addicted for life to uh, the Muskoka lifestyle. There I realized that there were just so many really important boats, not just race boats, but uh, all kinds of designs that were to me uh, the best blend of form and function that I'd ever seen. Of course, the, the excellence of the construction kind of blew me away. It was so much better than what I had experienced before. 
That, of course, led me in the logical direction of looking at Manette Shields' boats. Thanks to the, the tutelage of uh, the late John Blair, who educated me far more on the, the excellence of Manette's, the incredible designs of Ditch Burns, and especially the one-off boats. One a boat that was only manufactured once, but in fact it became the, the, the start of a series perhaps, as was the case with some of the early rainbow boats. That further enhanced my interest in, uh, in Muskoka boats. And as it turned out, I was fortunate enough to be invited many times to Muskoka, but I realized I could soon wear out my invitation. So uh, I decided it was time to, uh, to buy a place up here. After acquiring my very first boat, I had a hard time letting that boat go when I saw another one that I liked. That's, I think, where the collector mentality took over, where I couldn't bear to get rid of the first boat. And so another boat came along that had my interest, and then another and another. And I was very fortunate to, uh, to start getting the kind of boats that uh, really enhanced my knowledge of them, but also boats that I thought were important to Canadian history, and boats that I really thought uh, should stay in Canada, and especially stay in Muskoka. Well, Eaglet's one example of what's known as a one-off boat, where there was only one like it. The other manu major manufacturers, like Ditchburn and Gravette and so on, they also had a great reputation of producing some one-off boats. What easily comes to mind, of course, is Curlew, a 34-foot uh, Gravette streamliner that is known to be the very first streamliner that was ever produced. A boat that was longer than the others, uh, had a pointed bow as well as a pointed stern. And it uh, was a, a perfect example of a one-off boat that led to many other similar boats. And the, the history of the Gravette Streamliner carries on from the, uh, the mid-1930s right up through the late 50s. That, uh, to me, is a great example of what a one-off boat will contribute to history, uh, that it became the, the first and, in fact, a very special boat. Uh, Ditchburn, in addition to building the very early rainbow boats that were an inspiration for many other great hulls, one particular one that I feel fortunate in having in my boathouse is a boat called Dix. That's a very short ditch burn, pointed at both ends, and fits into what today we would call a gentleman's racer. And it has all kinds of great examples of fit and finish and styling. So it's, it's another example of something that's a one-off, but makes an important contribution to other boats that came along later. Eaglet was a very important boat for me to acquire uh, because of its provenance, uh, because of its incredible construction, and also because it was another one of those one-off boats where there was only one boat ever built exactly like Eaglet. True, there were many smaller versions of it, but Eaglet, I think, stands alone as the only 36-footer that was built exactly that way. It uh, is 36 feet long, it was built in 1927, and was originally powered with a Hall Scott engine with uh, 225 horsepower. But there were some uh, little foibles, I guess you'd say, with uh, an engine of that vintage. And fortunately, uh, there were other engines that came along just around that time that weren't aircraft engines like Eaglet had, but in fact, automobile engines that had been converted. And the Chrysler Straight 8 was just a classic that came out around the same time proved to be a very reliable engine. And in fact, in Muskoka, most of the old aircraft engines were replaced with the straight eight Chrysler engine. And that's what we did with Eaglet because it, it's made the boat just that much more reliable, that much more, much more quiet, and uh, quite frankly, just more enjoyable because we, we knew that the engine was always going to run, and indeed it has. The other things that impressed me about Eaglet, I think, were the fit and finish. As I learned more and more about a Manette Shields boat, I realized that the true genius of Bert Manette, not only in the design of the hull that goes through the water so effortlessly and handles all kinds of weather without making the passengers wet, the, uh, the fit and finish was amazing. The very fact that Bert Manette built the boat with book match planks so that they always matched as they correspondingly went out from the center line. The kind of hardware that was used on a Manette Shields boat seemed to be superior to any other. In fact, I remember one year I was uh, asked for a, a tour of the boathouse by a gentleman who was a former editor of the Rolls-Royce magazine, and he found me because he'd heard that Manette Shields used hardware from a Rolls-Royce car. He verified that yes, that really was the case as he examined the boat. It seems that, in fact, Bert Manette did build a boat for Henry Royce, who did have uh, a visitation time in Muskoka. So it gives an example that 
Manette Shields did things right. Bert Manette was known to not let a boat leave the, the shop unless it was absolutely perfect. Even if he had a, a penalty for a late delivery, it didn't matter. He was that obsessed with doing things the right way that the end result was there are so many wonderful Manette Shields boats on the lake today. Eaglet is a very fortunate boat that it was kept in the same boathouse for decades and as a result there's only a few uh, bottom planks that have ever been replaced and I think the, the upholstery has been replaced but other than that in its 94 year history uh, virtually all of the boat is original and that makes it rather special to me as well. Eagle has some interesting stories that of course uh, and experiences that the boat's gone through and one that I particularly remember is a recent uh, conversation that I had with Patty Duke who was the daughter of Dave Foreman who owned the boat for many years and whose family the boat had been since it was brand new. And Patty recalls how there was a, a performance going on at Dunn's Pavilion way down on Lake Muskoka which meant that the family had to travel from uh, Little Lake Joe or the entrance to Little Lake Joe all the way down through the Little Joe River and the locks and everything else to go to this performance. And Patty couldn't understand why with such a horrible weather situation that was predicted that her dad really wanted to go to this particular performance. Well, it turned out that uh, Louis Armstrong was her dad's favorite performer. And in fact, she learned that the other treat that night was that Dave, her father, got to play the drums with Louis Armstrong during the performance. So I guess it was worth it that night to go through all the fog, the rain, and cold weather. And in fact, Eaglet made, made the trip again without any kind of a scratch or damage whatsoever. Just one of the many things that uh, Eaglet was famous for. Eaglet was a boat that was part of a, a larger collection at Eagle Island, but it was a boat that was reserved for the special occasions. And it was known as the boat that David Foreman drove. No one else seemed to be ever driving Eaglet. That was David's boat to drive. One of the other hallmarks of, of taking a trip in Eaglet is that it's remarkably quiet. In fact, uh, as a wooden boat, or in fact any fiberglass boat, it's the quietest boat I've ever been in. And many people wonder, why does this boat perform so quietly? Well, as it turns out, underneath the driver's seat is a rather large muffler. It's probably this big, with a diameter like this, that muffles the sound going through the twin exhaust pipes so effectively that you can carry on a conversation almost anywhere in the boat except in the forward mother-in-law seat. And it's called a mother-in-law seat for those that haven't experienced it because if there's an engine between you and where your mother-in-law is seated, you probably won't hear her. Episode four did not disappoint. It was absolutely incredibly beautiful. And thank you everyone again for sharing all your incredible knowledge and video with us. Um, at the beginning of the, the episode, we you featured the Miss Canada series. And I just thought it'd be a great time to share some exciting news um, in regards to uh, some of the artifacts or objects that are associated with Miss Canada four. And as many of you may know, Miss Canada four is currently in our boathouse. Um, working with Harry Wilson, he's ecstatic to find out that uh, three um, artifacts that are currently in Calgary at the, um, at the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame are finally returning to Ontario. 
And we're gonna be the fortunate recipients of, of having these objects at the Discovery Center this summer. And for and a little bit of a holding pattern as pattern as they will finally make their final home uh, in um, Murray's um, Race Boat Museum when it when it opens. But it's it's exciting to have the 1934 CNE 225 Class Wood Championship Trophy. We're also getting the original Roto uh, propeller for Miss Canada Four and the original cast model of Miss Canada Four. So they will be on display for everyone to see this summer. So. Going into the questions right now, so a little bit more about boat racing. Does boat racing still exist in Muskoka? Maybe Murray, you'd like to answer that question? Yes, happy to answer that one. Uh, you know, the, the days of big motorboat racing uh, in, that we knew historically in Muskoka have stopped where there were races in, uh, for example, Foots Bay, uh, outside Foots Bay, rather up on uh, Lake Joe, uh, at the uh, Muskoka Lakes Golf and Country Club on Rosso, uh, Port Carling Bay had them. Uh, today, motorboat racing continues in uh, June of each year on Gull Lake in Gravenhurst, uh, where there's a very large uh, contingent of outboard racers. And as well, there's some Seafly uh, get togethers and racing that takes uh, place in mid July on Kashi Lake. So, motorboat racing on a smaller outboard scale is very much uh, alive in Muskoka. And in fact, there's a very active group in Ontario with uh, the Powerboat Association. Uh, racing in different venues as well. So motorboat racing is, is very much uh, still alive and it provides an exciting uh, venue for many people. Great. Uh, did the Rainbow and Miss Canada series of race boats set speed records? Uh, I guess I'll try that one again. Um, the Rainbow series uh, uh, owned by Harry Greening was quite successful. Uh, Mr. Greening came very close to winning the gold cup I think it was a small pin as part of the, uh, the mechanical aspect that uh, caused him to miss the 19, uh, rather one of the early 20s uh, gold cup races. Uh, in one race, he was quite ahead for a gold cup and was disqualified a couple of weeks after because although he had a shingled bottom on the bottom of the boat that was previously uh, approved, uh, perhaps a little politics, shall we say, got in the way and he was later disqualified and that victory was taken away from him. But later on, he did set a world record, which apparently still stands uh, for a 24 hour endurance record that was set with, uh, I believe it was Rainbow Three or Rainbow Four. So Mr. Greening certainly had his successes, but like many people in the racing business, you also have many sorrows along the way because it takes a lot of trial and tribulation to, to get to the winner's circle. Great. So how do you get old instruments like your speedometer, tack, et cetera, refurbished? Maybe Rick, you could answer that. Well, uh, there are a number of companies in the United States that do that. I don't think anybody does it in Canada. Um, one is Kosian. Uh, there's a, there's a couple of others, but if you get if you get into the ACBS uh, newsletter magazine, you'll see them advertised there, and they do absolutely excellent work. Uh, when you get it back, it'll look brand new. Super. Uh, so are there any other boats with curlew shape? Maybe Mary, you can answer that or, or Murray? Um, the only other one I know that was designed by John Hacker, uh, that's the same, I think, is a, a boat that's part of the Lee Anderson collection in Minnesota. Uh, perhaps the others can help me out with the name of that boat. It's very similar. And because it's done by the same designer, uh, some people might mistake it for curlew. So there are some significant differences to that boat, but it's one that I would call very similar. I think it's Lock Pat. Thank you, Ian. I and I think it has a very large V12 engine in it. Yes. Yeah. By the way, Curlew did have a large uh, V12 engine in it as well. Its original power was a V12 Scripps. I'm not sure the, which uh, engine is in the one that Lee Anderson has, but in any case, they were ample to put both boats forward at a pretty high speed. Okay, why was speedboat <coughs> racing so popular at the beginning of the last century? In my estimation, there's a number of factors that came together to make speedboat racing popular. 
back then it was easier and less expensive to have a very fast boat than in some cases it was to have a very fast car. The proliferation of aircraft engines certainly made it possible for a lot of uh, boats to be powered and to achieve speeds that in many cases were faster than automobiles could travel. Believe it or not, in the 20s and even into the 30s, 40s and 50s, it was not uncommon for there to be over a quarter of a million people on the shoreline of Windsor and Detroit watching the, uh, the Gold Cup races and, and other similar uh, sweepstakes kind of races that occurred. So motorboat racing was very popular. And of course, in the summertime in Muskoka, when people had some leisure time, uh, that was a great time for competition. Uh, as some people say, it only takes two boats going side by side to uh, constitute the start of a race. But in Muskoka, they were very fortunate in having uh, the, the venues in you know, Foots Bay, uh, Muskoka Lakes Association, and so on that were quite involved. And it, had, it drew great crowds, but it drew lots of participants. And in fact, that's part of what made Muskoka boating interesting, that there was such competition to have not only the most beautiful boat, but in many cases, the fastest boat the biggest engine, and so on. Great, thank you. Mary, I'm gonna get you to turn your microphone on because I'm gonna ask you the next question. Why did Gravet decide to build Dispro boats after building race boats and runabouts? I don't know the true answer, it's just my idea. Um, since they've been built in Port Carling and also Lindsay and Tonawanda, um, I think Tom Gravett was looking for a way to make money and uh, he wanted to pick up the uh, design of that and the rights to make those boats and did that quite successfully, uh, built a lot of them um, towards the end of the Dispro era. So uh, I, I think maybe it was a business deal as much as anything else, but it was nice to know that they uh, returned back to Muskoka to be built to, in Gravenhurst as opposed to Port Carling. And I wonder if I can just go back to uh, what Murray was saying a moment ago about races in various locations. And when I was a kid, which of course was a couple of decades ago, I remember quite vividly the races here on the Indian River on the Big Bay called Minnehaha Bay. But what I particularly remember was being on the docks at the old Port Carling Boat Works and Hugh McLennan worked there as a mechanic. And one of the boats that was racing for the wooden boat watchers, they'll recognize it was a Chris Craft Cobra. So it had a fin on the back. It had a, a big fin. I think the Cobras, Rick, you all know this, they were built in the 50s, were they? Uh, uh, yeah, late 50s, early 60s. Right. So it had, it had a very large V8 engine in it, which was red. And I believe it was a Cadillac engine. It came into the dock and Hugh McLennan, who was a wonderful character, this is Hugh McLennan Sr., was, was asked to look at it because the engine was smoking. So there I was as a kid staring at this incredible Chris Craft with a fin on the back. The engine hatch is open, a great big red Cadillac engine smelling pretty hot. But that boat had been roaring around the bay here in Port Carling at high speed. If the OPP had been around in their um, uh, boats the way they are these recent summers, I imagine they might have had some comments on the races. But in those days, it was just great fun. And I think that it, just picking up on that and, and Murray's comments, it was so easy to race a boat. Uh, you, you just needed a little bit of open space and, and, and someone to compete with. And uh, whereas car racing, you, you know, you need a a track and you need a, a specific place to do it. Uh, but the other thing is just the liability and the insurance issues that have come up so that many cottage associations who would sponsor uh, various thing, various boat racing at various regattas and that those kind of events, this can't do it. They wouldn't do it um, for insurance reasons. I would also urge people to come back in uh, to next week's episode because we'll be featuring uh, three large Gold Cup race boats next week. And uh, as a preamble to those films, I'll be putting in some images about racing on the Muskoka Lakes that are, are pretty old, but they're pretty dramatic and they really make the points that Rick and Marie have made. Excellent. So now a technical question. How does a folding windshield work and what <laughs> Are they built? Why are they built that way? Mostly for ventilation. 
but they uh, they rotate one way or the other on on posts that either go down so they can swing this way. Uh, I think Murray the Manettes also have posts this way so they can not only swing that way but they can fold forward as well. But yes, um, very basic hinge system. Okay, so does Grayson Spain own all the boats on display or are they on loan from time to time? I could answer that question, but I'm going to let you folks. <laughs> well, as you know, they, they may own, um, they, they have from time to time owned a boat, but uh, they're all owned by someone else. And the advantage of that is that you can change the display from time to time by uh, um, bringing in new boats and you get the opportunities, or if you must insist, uh, you know, send a boat back to its owner. Well, I'll just elaborate a little bit on that. You know, it, it's a wonderful yeah. opportunity to have a, a, you know, an exhibit that is rotating of these beautiful uh, boats. And as we watch the uh, these episodes of the series, many of the boats have been in our boathouse. So it, it offers our, our visitors to the Muskoka Discovery Center something new to see every year. And uh, we're always amazed and, and um, appreciate the, the beauty of the boat. And, you know, you get to see it in two different uh styles in the water and then when they're lifted during the winter. So our visitors are get to experience what uh, many of you get to own. So, okay, so the next question is, uh, are we seeing much interest in these classics among Generation Y folks? And uh, it's a two part question. So we'll start with that question. Oh, I'll take a little stab at it for starters. Um, I think it depends uh, a lot. You know, so many of us got involved with the wooden boats based on nostalgia for what we remember. In the case of my family, because my daughter grew up with them, she tends to be very active in them and the kids are very excited. So there's a, an intergenerational aspect there. But I think there's a lot of people in the younger generation that are realizing these boats are not only uh, they're not only old, but they're also fun to drive. The, uh, the modern power, in fact, even a lot of the older power can really propel the boats through the water at a very respectable speed. And uh, they're recognizing that the boats are not functional or are functional as well as being an art form, that there really is something exceptional about them. And when you start to compare them with the cost of many of the new fiberglass boats, they're remarkably less expensive. So there's lots of good reasons why younger people can and should be uh, uh, and are involved with uh, the younger or rather the wooden boats. I was lucky enough to go back to Florida after a few years and uh, went to the boat show in Mount Dora and uh, actually Tavares. And there were a, a number of new owners uh, and they were definitely younger. And, uh, and their experience was that uh, for 15, 20, $25,000, they could buy something that in wood that was old and had a story to go with it. Uh, versus, you know, a, a multiple of that for something that looked like everybody else's ski boat. Okay, well, the second part to that question was, is what are prospects for these boats in Canada? Um, are boomers passing them on? Again, I'll take a little stab at um, I think a lot of boats are, are, are being passed on, but I think there's different people have different interests in the boats. Uh, sometimes it may be a social interest uh, based on neighbors who have one and they have an exposure to them that way. So I think that's helping in terms of the continuation. I think some are just plain appealing to people based on their aesthetics. So new people are coming in and realizing that. Um, you know, we still have a large number of wooden boats on the Muskoka Lakes. As many people have said, it's still the largest repository of wooden boats in North America. And fortunately, we have the boathouses to keep them in. Uh, if there was anything that might be discouraging it, it's the fact that in many cases where there's a two-slip boathouse that has had the family boat and, and the wooden boat, uh, the ski boat seems to have offered a little bit of competition for the space. And sometimes the wooden boat is being pushed out. But again, there's a resurgence that's happening as well. And there are many boats that are returning to the Muskoka Lakes that might have left. And there's also some uh, boats from other areas of the world that are also choosing to come to Muskoka. Uh, 
it's such a great place to do wooden boating or boating of any sort. Great. There were two boats on Lake of Bays many years ago, the Penguin and the Dolphin, owned by the Nielsen family. Does anyone know which make these were and were, where are they today? Well, the Penguin was a, was a Minette, Minette Shields. Murray, do you know the Dolphin? I don't know the Dolphin. I, I have to abstain there. I think Penguin was renamed not too many years ago. If I recall, was. do you remember? It was a flying lady? No? Flying, I, yes. I'm, I'm guessing, but I think it's the same boat and it's a very beautiful boat. Yes. Okay. Why do I see so much water coming out of the exhaust? Is there an advantage to combine cooling with exhaust? And why do you see so much rapid change in the amount of water? Well, there is an advantage in, the, in as much as it muffles the, uh, the exhaust. And it's a convenient way to just to get rid of the cooling water overboard. Uh, it has, so you'd have to uh, have some other outlet for it if it didn't go through the exhaust pipe, but it definitely helps to muffle the sound, which is a huge advantage. I, I want to chime in there and say, I hope you all stay tuned uh, for episode six on April 27th. Chris made a habit as he was filming for all the episodes of taking shots, as you've seen, of the exhaust as the boat starts. And if you listen carefully, you'll notice that initially there's no water and you hear that bit of a bark in the exhaust. And then after a period of time, the water pump has pushed a load of water through the engine and it comes out of the exhaust. So you saw it in today's episode, episode in particular, I think, in Curlew and also in Dix. But on uh, April 27th, we're up on Lake Joseph by film from last summer. And there's some astounding footage that Chris got of Scud 2 starting. And Scud is a Manette Shields with an original Hall Scott engine, a very large engine, with a very large amount of water pumping through that engine. And he gets it perfectly shooting out of the exhaust pipe. It's quite dramatic. So... Tune in for episode seven and you'll see a whole lot more water coming up. Great. Um, so we're getting at the end of our questions. I thought I'd have a, a question for Chris Bullen. Um, Chris, maybe you could just give us any updates you might have on uh, the upcoming boat show. And also April is usually spring tour month. Anything happening with spring tour? Yeah, spring tour is online again. We're currently filming it and uh it's being put together by Mike and it'll be out at the end of the month, all the shops for the spring tour. I think we're doing it in three different stages. And uh, so that is, I was just filming Ken Lavalette's last, last night. And so we've got many shops again this year, some that we didn't have last year. And so there's a few more. And unfortunately we can't all be there, um, you know, because of the COVID situation, but we're, uh, we're making the best of it. And we get a lot more information when you're filming it, actually. You know, you walk in and you just look at the wooden boat, but when you're filming it, you know, the builders are telling us all about them. So it's actually quite, quite interesting, but we'd like to get back to the uh, being there. It's a lot more fun to see everybody. And then uh, the boat show is, is in full swing planning, uh, July 9th. Uh, we're going to have um, runs on Friday, a fast run and a slow run for different boats. And uh, so we're excited to get back to a live event. Great. I'm just going to give a little heads up to both Rick and Ian for next week. I'll ask a question about the MLA show at the end. So you get prep time. That's Rick's baby. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so August I'm, the 13th. Hey, and, hey next uh, week, Rick, next week. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? I said it's next week I was going to ask you. I was just giving you prep. But oh, if you'd like to go ahead this I'll, week, you can. Well, I, I think I've answered it twice. I've actually started to get phone calls from people who uh, <laughs> said, "Remember," who would say, "Remember me when you put out the invites." Perfect. And the, just remind me of the date again: August. August thirteenth. Perfect. Uh, so over to John. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. I don't have anything to add. Um, 
I just like to thank our panelists. I was just thinking it'd be great if we could, uh, if someone could send some questions in next week that would stump these people because uh, I don't think we could find a better collection of experts on this this stuff. It's amazing. Um, and thank you to our audience. Uh, we did make a change to the series. Uh, May 4th and May 11th episodes are going to be combined and shown on May 4th. So May 4th will be the conclusion of the series. Uh, so we're effectively, I believe we're over halfway through uh, this webinar series. So uh, again, thank you to everyone that was involved. Thank you to our audience and we will see you next week.